Okay, so welcome back. This is the second to last uh, lecture. This is, uh, we're closing up the course, trying to give you a, a survey of the most important ideas of um, advanced uh, macroeconomics where you can go in, into detail in a, in a future course maybe or um, in a seminar. <clears throat> I guess um, you'll notice the pace of this will be a bit slower, but maybe for that reason, very important to pay attention uh, to what I'm saying. <clears throat> so <clears throat> many people have asked about the exam, and I guess you've all uh, been told by Leopold, and I'll just repeat what we have here planned for you. It's a 90-minute exam. Um, if you've been coming to the repetition section, the, uh, the, the uh, tutorial, you'll have a really good idea of what to expect. Um, I, I always say there's a very high correlation with the problem sets. Um, some some problems may even appear identically. So if you if you if you nail the problem set, you'll be able to do that um, in a fairly straight straight uh, forward way. Um, there'll be some multiple choice, and there'll be some um, either true true false uncertain or multiple choice. We haven't decided yet. We're sort of limited in the amount that we can do, which is fine. But um, this gives you a, a sort of um, ability to get many points or, or, or not. So if you, if you don't prepare well, um, you won't do so well on that. And there'll be some mathematical derivations, like always, um, as on the problem sets. Now, a lot of people ask, open or closed book? So I'll tell you next week. This will give you an incentive to continue to, to review and, and study. Um, there's a, um, the answer to that question is based on a, a famous uh, saying, um, trust is good, control is better. And if, if you know who said that, um, then maybe you'll get an extra bonus point on the, on the final, but it'll also tell you a little bit about how the final exam will be, will be dealt with. Okay, so we'll, I'll give you the answer to that next week if you're interested. Okay, last time we looked at um, the new Keynesian aggregate supply curve. So this is a, a way of justifying an upward sloping AS curve in the undergraduate world. And I'm gonna expand on this a little bit by talking about the interaction of two things. One is why does money matter? Why do nominal prices matter? Why does the nominal rate of inflation matter in the short run? Um, and, and how does the economy react to that? So that's, we'll talk about real and nominal rigidities. The, the, the former uh, nominal rigidities is the, un, the understanding of why people set prices in terms of money units, why people set wages in terms of the monetary unit. And yet we know that in the long run this doesn't matter. People care about the real purchasing power of their wages and the real purchasing power of their income. Uh, given prices of goods and services, you need all that information to make that calculation. So, you know, people are unhappy when the price level in Germany surges by 10% as a result of the, of the gas problem with, uh, with, with Russian gas and, and the world price of gas rising by 500%. Well, it's not surprising that people don't, aren't too happy about that because it's a real change in your, in your command over resources. Um, I will go into some detail on the Calvo model. So if you go on to pursue macroeconomics, you'll find that the, both the Rodenberg model and the Calvo model are important ways to understand how the economy um, reacts to a change in nominal aggregate demand and that prices do not rise 100% to make money neutral instantly. There are reasons for that, and that's the intellectual fascination of macroeconomics is trying to get that get that story straight. And, and the Calvo model is the leading, it's probably the leading model that is used in the new Keynesian uh, Phillips curve analysis or the new Keynesian um, macro model. And I'll try to explain why that's the case. It has the, the uh, beauty of having some microeconomic foundations as does the Rodenberg model, but it has some other uh, nice characteristics. Once I do that, um, we'll be able to combine um, something we've already learned about why people try to substitute consumption today versus tomorrow based on an interest rate and their preferences with the interest rate that's set by the central bank. So once we put those ingredients together, we'll have all we need to, to solve for the aggregate demand curve. 
So in effect, we'll have an aggregate supply curve. We derived it last week, and we'll do it this week. And then at the end of the day, we'll do aggregate demand. And then we'll have a story that is much more serious about why the aggregate demand curve is downward sloping and why the aggregate supply is upward sloping. Okay? And we can use a computer, as we'll do, um, you know, as, as I will show you how to do next week, to solve this model. We can shock it one time, we can shock it many times, like we, we did when we talked about the Slutsky paradigm. You can think of um, the economy's dynamic and the business cycle itself as being the culmination of reacting to all those shocks. So last time we talked about money, I showed you the picture of David Hume. I argued that even Hume understood that a surprise injection of money a surprise uh, arrival of gold would have a stimulative effect on the economy because people are sort of thinking about the old prices, maybe they've written some contracts on the old prices, and even when we're talking about gold, what matters is using the nominal means of payment to denominate lots of prices, and these prices don't adjust immediately. That's the secret of macroeconomics. That's what John Maynard Keynes basically came up with um, in the 1930s, and we're still using this idea, carrying it around. So even though there was a huge injection of liquidity in 2008, even though the central banks opened the floodgates and flooded the money, the markets with money, the Bank of um, England, the European Central Bank, the, the Fed, the Bank of China, they pumped lots of, the price level didn't rise, okay? Even though the money supply was growing a little bit faster, the, money, the price level didn't rise. And my take on this and the take of 90% of macroeconomists is that there are reasons why the decentralized market economy does not react immediately to those types of stimuli because they don't understand it's a systematic permanent increase in money. And a lot of that money didn't even reach the banking system in terms of uh, deposits that, that you would own. So it was just sitting there at the central bank. So this is the kind of thing we would like to understand. Why? I tried to talk about why prices could be sticky. I gave you a couple of stories for that. Uh, one is the, the adjustment cost involved with moving the price level very fast or moving a price very fast. So individually firms and, <clears throat> and enterprises and, and even workers setting wages um, are averse to very rapid changes in their microeconomic environment and that would cause them to slow things down. The other thing was just it may not be possible for them to do that, okay? So we had two models we talked about. One is Rodenberg, and I think uh, you'll probably talk about that in, um, in the section if you haven't done it already. And then the other one is Calvo. And Calvo is, the, like I said, the leading, the leading model, and I'll spend some more time talking about that today. So this is the picture that you should remember. And the picture shows, basically, if we allow firms to set prices, then we're departing from the pure competitive paradigm of, of economics. Firms are not price takers, they're price setters. And if you allow firms to set prices, why do they set prices? Because they want to maximize profits. How do they set prices? They set marginal revenue equal marginal cost. And they choose the price that corresponds to the quantity that equates marginal revenue and marginal cost. And then what happens when the demand curve shifts? Well, if the firm were at liberty and perfectly free to set the new price anywhere it wanted, it would choose a new price but it doesn't do that. So when the, the curve shifts from D to D prime, uh, the question is what does the firm do? It was charging P star at the old demand curve and the old marginal revenue curve and the old marginal cost curve, but now we have a new situation. That's the right-hand side of this diagram. And the right-hand side of the diagram, you can see that take two extremes. One is the firm doesn't change its price at all, and the other is it goes to its optimum, its new optimum price, now called P star in the right-hand side. You can see that it's higher. Okay, so what does it do? What did we learn last time? Can the, can the firm still make money charging the old price, not increasing its price? Yeah, and we see that because for every additional unit it sells, the price is the marginal revenue. If it's locked into a price, P bar, then every additional unit it sells, it gets P bar, and that's a lot more than marginal costs. So it's making money on those extra units. It's just not doing the best it can. So we have, a, we have, a little, we have an obvious tension between, do I adjust? Well, if I don't adjust, I still make some money, I'm making lots of money actually on the margin, 
but I could do even better if I raise my price, if I raise my price to P star. So that's the question. Do I, do I stay or do I go? Do I raise the price or do I leave it the way it was? And the, the loss of not changing the price is the red triangle. Because on those additional units, you could make more money at a higher pr uh, price. Uh, otherwise, you're producing at rising marginal costs and the marginal revenue is falling. So you're not doing the very, very best you can. You're still making money. Price exceeds marginal cost. But marginal revenue is actually lower than marginal cost. So think about that. That's important. That would rationalize both Rodenberg, because Rodenberg says changing quickly is where those costs of changing prices come from, or it could be Calvo, who says you just can't change it because you, you don't have the authorization. So suppose you're in the store and your boss was out to lunch and he should have told you to raise prices, but he didn't. So for some random reason, you didn't get the authorization. And the way Calvo had this beautiful idea, which I'll detail in a second, is that basically a random arrival of the ability to change prices, either because you're distracted or because something else is going on in the other departments and people are in a meeting or something, but for some reason prices don't get adjusted instantaneously. So the second one is kind of, it sounds a bit ad hoc. It sounds like we're just assuming what we want to have. Well, it turns out that it's a pretty good approximation of the way people actually behave. But it has some disadvantages that I already mentioned last week. I already talked about why the Calvo model is, is a bit wobbly. Okay, and we'll come back to it maybe at the end of the hour. Okay, so we have, a, we have a foundation, two different foundations, and I'll give you another one next week for the upward sloping new Keynesian aggregate supply curve. Okay, because we only had this aggregate supply curve and I just told you it was upward sloping and then I made some hand waving, but now I've got a, a good story. I've got two good stories. Okay, now I'll give you, I'll give you a third story on, on uh, next week. Stories. Fact is, it's difficult to get into the microeconomics of a firm because there are millions of firms being setting millions of prices every day in this economy. Sometimes they don't. So we're looking for a shortcut to catch this, okay? So the Rodenberg model, we have this cost of changing a lot, and it's rising. So we have convex costs in the distance of the change. That's a, that's a pretty nice way of summarizing why my barber doesn't change his price every day. In fact, I showed you the data from Italy. They change it like once every year they change the price. It's empirical fact. Whereas the price of gasoline changes every day. So prices are different. And the Calvo parameter would capture for each good, actually, a different uh, cost of changing prices. And for the, for the macro analysis, we'll just assume an average type of C. OK, so this C measures nominal price rigidity. OK, in the Calvo model, it's that probability of being able to change your price. That's 1 minus phi. Phi was the probability of being stuck. Think of yourself as being at lunch. And you're having lunch, and in the meantime, your costs are exploding, or there's a demand surge, and you wanted to change, you should be changing your price, but you're having lunch. Okay? Or, you know, maybe somebody quit, and the guy who was supposed to change the price quit. It's a random event that you can't control. So the, that, sort of, uh, that sort of story is what Calvo told to motivate his account for nominal price rigidity. Because you're pricing the good. The beer place across the, the street, the old bar that my students used to go to in the 1990s, they used to change their prices relatively rarely. And the reason why is because if they raise their beer price, this was before the euro. This is in the DMARC days when Germany was having a little rise in inflation in the 1993-94 period. They didn't raise their price because they didn't want to aggravate their dear customers who would never come back again. Because back then, East Germans were really look, pinching pennies. They were pin, pinching Fennig. They were really being very stingy. And they saw, well, this guy's raising his price to, to 1 euro 50 for a, for a glass of beer. That's just, that's, that's highway robbery. Okay, and they would never go back there again. That's the idea behind, behind Rodenberg. In Calvo, it's different. It's just the, the place was distracted, okay? So the measure of rigidity is phi. 
It's the probability of being stuck in the current period. But you're not stuck forever. Because phi is, a, is like a, it's almost like a discount factor. It's a little bit like the cost of, it has some, something to do with the, with the cost of waiting. And both of these, these stories are, are leading examples of the new Keynesian Phillips curve or the new Keynesian supply curve. I prefer to call it the supply curve because there's no unemployment explicitly in our story yet. <clears throat> But you can see that they look very similar. So on the right-hand side, I've written down the old-fashioned undergraduate AS curve. And on the, right, the left-hand side, I've got two motivations for it. And you can almost look and see what's going on there. On the left-hand side, you've got different things that look like B1 on the right-hand side. That was the, the slope of the aggregate supply curve, remember? And you can see where it's coming from. In the Calva model, it's coming from phi and it's coming from beta. Beta is the sensitivity of your optimal price to the level of aggregate demand or output in the economy. And in the Rodenberg model, it's, it's beta. It's this the same beta <clears throat> divided by the cost of adjusting. So there are two different accounts for this, this story. So you can think of this as a, a Phillips curve. Again, I, if, you, if you call it a Phillips curve, then you're kind of assuming that the Unemployment deviation from the natural or equilibrium rate is the same as the output deviation from trend. You can assume that, but there's no proof of that. So we'll keep unemployment out of the picture until uh, maybe some of the more advanced course that you might take. Okay, so what you see and learn from this picture and from these models, and the picture I'm gonna show you in a second, is that it, it's basically, a, you need to have both nominal rigidity and you also have to have real rigidity to make this model have a positive supply curve slope. For the, for the positive slope you need, you need something like a small beta and a big C, or a, a phi that's really close to one, and you also need a small beta. So the, the idea is that the, the firm doesn't lose a lot of money by not raising the price, and it's also costly for it to raise the price, or it's, in, it's difficult to raise the price. This is gonna determine the size of that red triangle, ultimately. So a firm might say, well, I could raise my price, but it's not gonna raise my profits very much. That would be a, a statement about the slope of the profit function around the price that the firm is currently charging. And if it's not, if it's not, there's no gain from changing your price, why bother? And of course, if the consumers punish you for raising the price, then of course you really don't want to raise your price. So these are again micro justifications for price rigidity uh, and the effect of price rigidity, i.e. not having uh, firms and indeed also workers changing their prices all the time. Okay, so <clears throat> David, uh, Romer has this nice picture in his textbook, and he's worked on this uh, for many years, <clears throat> thinking about the profit function. So we don't have a, you know, we have a profit function in that picture in the background because the firm is maximizing profits and cho chooses for some reason not to move to P star. It's a statement about the slope of the profit function around the, the price the firm is currently uh, charging. So if PI is that price and the vertical is the profit, that means that if the, the firm is optimizing its uh, profits with respect to price, it would be choosing the top of that, that hill. And the question is, what happens when that profit curve shifts? If we have a shift to aggregate demand, do I do something about it or I just say, nah, I'm, no, I'm gonna hit, take the red triangle hit and just keep my price the same. So one way of thinking about that is putting a microscope to the change in the, in the price I would have ch taken had I been completely li at, at liberty to do so or the P star that I chose initially. And you can see that it's actually a combination of two things. It's a combination of the slope of the profit function, and that's the real rigidity, and it's also how far do I wanna move the price, and that's gonna be a function of the, the nominal rigidity. Okay, so this is just a, some intuition for why this is such a powerful idea. It took a long time for, to move from Keynes, who started thinking about rigid prices, but didn't really have a good story, 
He just said people don't want to change their prices. But we can do better than that. So after 50 years of thinking about it, we have some serious stories about why this is the case. But you know, as you can see, there's a bit of tension in both. And there, these stories are not perfect. But I'm going to give you this Calvo story now, because the Calvo story is really interesting, because it goes back to firms maximizing profits, not just minimizing costs like I had last week. That's the easy way. That's how I teach undergraduates. But your graduates are going to think about the firm is doing the best it can and faces these costs. So you know, the, the Calvo model assumes, just to review, review this for you, the, the firm basically sets its price. That's, the, that's axiom number one. Secondly, it's gonna, you can show, and we will show today, that the firm will try to set its price when it can to some average of future desired prices over the, over the next periods. And it will be discounting by this rigidity parameter and possibly a discount rate. So using the Roberts framework from last week, we had the price the firm freely sets, if it can set price, which would be PT, is a weighted average of its desired price today and the expected prices that it would have set in the future. Okay, so it's a, it's a recursion. Depends on, and you don't know it for sure because you don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow, so you take an expectation of that. Okay, so that's the Calvo model we talked about last time. Otherwise, it's kind of stuck. So Calvo, you really are stuck. If you can't change your price, you charge the old price, and you, you will possibly make more or less money than you would have had you the, had the right to and the, the, the privilege of changing the price. But if you don't, yeah, so be it. It turns out that the aggregate price consists of a lot of other firms in the same situation as my firm that I just described. So you can describe the price level of all the other firms, which is also the price level um, that we observe when we construct the inflation rate as being a weighted average of those prices that are changed today and the ones that are not changed. Okay, and I, I showed you with some, doing some algebra from last time, you could derive this new Keynesian Phillips curve, uh, which I already put on the, on the screen before. So, because P prime is the price of all the firms in the economy. You see that it has three parts. The first part is the expectation of the future. So if, you, if so, those firms who have the chance to change prices will change them um, thinking about the price uh, in the next period. And then you also have the sensitivity to the state of aggregate demand in the economy. And then the last part is this shock that we haven't talked about, but is clearly weighing heavily on us right now. This is the, the European uh, dilemma, importing lots of gas from a country that, that's raised uh, its, pro has, has constricted its supply, and we're actually constricting the supply ourselves, so that means the energy prices are higher. That last part is a one-off shock um, that uh, occasionally hits the economy. It has the same impact um, for those firms who are able to change their prices would take that into account. Okay, so that, I showed you last time, I put these slides in just so, so you can remind yourself, you can take that pricing equation, lead it by one period, you can insert it in the original, and you can get what's called a recursion. And you can see that today's inflation depends on tomorrow's inflation and tomorrow, tomorrow's inflation once again, because it's, the, it's the sub, after the substitution. And what's left is basically an assessment of the state of aggregate demand and the shocks over the next period. And you could do that again and again and again. And after applying the iteration, the law of iterated expectations, the expectation of the shocks that are not observed goes to zero. And you can repeat this t times. And you can end up getting basically that the current inflation is a forward-looking weighted average of future expected aggregate demand plus the shock today. This is called a forward-looking um, Phillips curve. And that's the same characteristic we had with the, with the Rodenberg uh, setup last time. OK, so this is just to motivate what we're going to do now. Now I'm going to try to try to give you some details where Calvo got all this from. And it wasn't just Calvo. It was Calvo and all his students, and especially Jordi Galli, who was a 
very famous economist um, in Barcelona at, the, um, at Pompeo Fabra. He's also Lutz, Professor Branca's uh, thesis advisor. Okay, so this is, a, this is basically what I'm gonna give you now kind of follows his explication of this model. The first thing is you, firms are setting prices. So you, if firms can set prices, they have a demand curve. And where does that demand curve come from? <laughs> What's so funny? This is economics, man. You gotta get into it. Where does the demand come from? If the firm is setting a price, there's a demand curve, who's behind the demand curve? Yeah. Consumers, households. So we have to think about the household. So now we're gonna go into the heads of the households. How does the household, how does the household figure out what it's gonna do? Utility, so you, micro foundations. Households have utility over what? They have utility over goods and not just one consumption good, but it's a whole bunch of consumption goods. So it's a, a basket, a bundle of goods, right? And that's only gonna work if you make every little product a little bit different. Beer is not the same thing as mineral water, not the same thing as orange juice, and the demand for these various things are not gonna be the same, clearly. So we're gonna have a utility function that is a function of consumption, and consumption is a bundle. And the bundle consists of a lot of goods that go into this bundle. So now it's becoming more realistic. Right? The, so the, you're gonna, we're gonna have this, this, the first part of the, of the nesting is utility over consumption and disutility over labor. But then you've got this bundle, and this thing is really fancy. If you go on to do economics, quantitatively, this is a very important function. This is a CES, constant elasticity of substitution aggregator. A CES aggregator. It's a very fancy way of adding up a lot of stuff and generating a number which corresponds to either utility directly or some measure of consumption. All right, so this epsilon is an important par parameter. Okay, it's gonna be greater than one, and it can be real big, it can be real small, it'll be very close to one, and you can see that makes a difference, makes a big difference on how this thing is gonna behave. And there's one case where it actually, you get the logarithmic function that comes out of it. So you think of a sum of a bunch of logarithms of, of people's consumption of different goods. Now this, this integral means that I'm summing over a, a large number of different products, and each product has an I, a name, okay? So I'm gonna integrate from zero to one, which is the list, the, the, the total number of products is, is on this interval. In fact, there's an infinite number of them in the theory, so there's just a lot of them. And the di is the, is the dummy, the I is the dummy variable of integration. I'm summing up all these different products. And each product enters my valuation of, as consumption as a function of, of this, this epsilon. And of course, how much I'm consuming. Otherwise, they're all the same. So it's kind of a, you have a, a symmetry which is which hardwired into the problem. It doesn't have to be that way, but it's gonna certainly make it easier for us to look at. So because each one of these products matters for me, I'm gonna have a demand for it. I'm not gonna consume all of one product, that would be stupid, because as long as the, as long as epsilon, as long as epsilon does not imply perfect substitution of the products, I'm gonna to wanna to have a little bit of everything. Love of variety, it's called. So every product will have a demand curve that's downward sloping. And I'm gonna show how the maximization problem of the consumer leads to a downward sloping demand curve for every product I. And that's why we can talk about a representative product, I, produced by a representative firm, I, and each firm has a, a certain you know, unique product that it's selling, and the consumer wants to have a little bit of everyone. And then that gives the producer the ability to set the price 
and that's going to give us the monopolistic competition that we want in the new Keynesian model. Okay, so if you want to go on to do this, this is kind of a, the painful uh, um, route you have to do, which is to try to derive that demand curve. So take this second nest nesting and plug that into the first one, and we have our result. You want to have, you really want to consume a little bit of everything. So if you define these i's, the integral is just a fancy way of saying it's a sum. So you could say they're just 10 products, and you're just summing over the 10 products, but you still have that functional form, which means I really want to have a little bit of everything. I'm much better off if I don't just drink water all day. I want to have water, orange juice, beer, rum, um, <laughs> coffee, different products. It's called love of variety. And I can tune that love of variety by playing around with the epsilon. Okay, so I've just shown you something, a really important technical trick in economics, the CES, constant elasticity of substitution aggregator. So, you know, the only reason I'm doing this is to show you that you can micro-found this model that I just showed you before. Remember, in the background, we still have these, 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 these firms that are selling each product I, and they're trying to decide, should I change my price or not? And I just want to remind you that that's the real reason we do this. The CES function is just a way of, it's like icing on the cake to justify the downward sloping demand curve and make it consistent with aggregation and income, because the income has to be earned by the consumers, and the consumers have to spend it. But this is the key part, the notion of being able to change your price not any time you want. You have to sort of obey the Calvo ferry, the Calvo um, randomness that says, OK, I'm, this is the time to change my price. I'm going to change it. And I'm going to look forward and try to anticipate all the other periods when I'd like to change the price, perhaps, but can't. OK, so just to remind you, this, is, this phi is so important. Because 1 minus phi is the probability that you can change today and the probability that you can change in two periods but not in the first period, is going to be 1 minus phi times phi. And you can define that as a density for the distribution of probability mass on every period I may have to wait. I have to wait one period, two periods. I'm not going to have to wait infinity periods, because the, pro the probability of that happening is going to be 0. But it could be a long time. I could get stuck, um, set it like my Italian barber, setting the price for like a year or two years without changing it. Okay, and you can show that the probability function here is a, is a density because it adds up to one. All the probabilities have to add up to one. That's a, a law for a probability rule for a density. So you can sum them up. It's just a geometric, it's a geometric sum. Okay, that's good news. And you can also compute the expected time until I get to change my price again. I told you that last time. You probably forgot already. But it's 1 over 1 minus phi. OK, and that's the proof of that. If you're interested, it's usually, you have to use a little calculus. It's not a big deal. But it's just it's showing you that the expected number of periods is 1 divided by 1 minus phi. So if phi is 0.5, if I get have a 50% chance of being able to change my price in each period, the average time I'll have to wait between price changes is going to be 2, 1 over 1 minus 0.5. OK, that's a fact. So if phi gets really, really large, the time between changing prices is going to get really long. So if phi is 0.9, I have to wait how many periods? If phi is equal to 0.9, yeah, 10. So if it's a quarterly model, 10 periods. It's a long time. It's two and a half years. It's a big chunk of your life. <laughs> That's the average. So the, a fascinating thing in macro models is how often do firms change prices? And how much traction is that going to give us for monetary policy? Because some firms will already start changing prices. They'll be lucky, and some won't. Okay, you can see that's a strength and a weakness of the Calvo model. We'll come back to that. OK, 
Okay, so here's the example I just gave you. 10 months, if it's a monthly model. So again, you have to specify whether this phi applies to the monthly probability or the quarterly probability. And I just gave you the example of quarters. That's a long time. If it's month, nah, still 10 months is a long time. And you can actually use data to calibrate the model, looking at how long it takes for certain firms or how often a firm changes its prices. So now I'm going to go back to this horrible function that scared you a little bit, this CES aggregator. I'm going to show you how that gives us a nice, beautiful, downward sloping demand curve that you can reconcile with the fact that the households want the goods, they got to earn money to pay for the goods, and they can hold wealth to carry forward their purchasing power into the future. So this is following uh, Jordi Gali's book. Okay, so this, we had this nested form of the function I showed you already. Here's, the, here's that horrible function. Now, that's the problem the consumer would solve if you gave it logarithmic utility over the basket, and then you define the basket using the CES Armington or isoelastic utility aggregator. So that's the complete, the complete problem for the consumer. Maximize my utility. I get consumption. I have to pay for it. So I have to pay using the euros, right? And where do I get these? Where do I get these euros? Well, I have to earn them, and they're earned in nominal terms. The bonds are in nominal terms, and the price of the goods are in nominal terms. So now everything's in euros. Here's utility. This is the definition of the army of the aggregator. So I'm choosing each one of these. Um, these C J's, I'm going to use J as a dummy variable of integration. So this is the utility I get from the basket of C J's that I choose, and it enters here. And then I've got this budget constraint, which shouldn't surprise you. You know, I can save money. And the way I save it now is I use my, mon my money to buy nominal debt, call that B. And B pays interest rate I. And I is what? That's the nominal interest rate in terms of money. So if I put in 10 euros, I get 1 plus I times 10 in one period. Right? Nominal interest rate. So the whole, the whole model is much more interesting than the real business cycle model where you had no money. Now we've got money. The price level P we haven't defined yet. And the reason why is because you need to know the price of all the little goodies that go into the Armington aggregator to get the price level. The price level P is a function of all the individual prices of all the firms whose output we're buying and whose prices are being set a la Calvo. Okay? So this is a little bit more detail on this function because it is kind of shocking to look at it, but it has beautiful properties. First off, it's symmetric. So we're, we're calling these goods abstractly um, as if they have equal weight in the utility function, but you can change that. It just changes a little bit of the, the tractability of this model. The whole idea of, these, of a model is to make your thinking about the world a bit simpler. Of course, you can have asymmetric uh, weights on these individual elements, but we don't have that. So we're going to take a symmetric view of the individual elements of which firms are pricing now, OK? But since the symmetry holds, the price and equilibrium for all these firms are going to be very similar. So that's going to be another trick to help us get a quick answer. The price level in that case will not depend on individual attributes of the goods in the basket. It will depend on the level of aggregate demand. And that's what we want. OK, so properties. Homothetic. What does homothetic mean? If I scale up all the C's for all the I, then basically the consumption itself, the bundle itself, has scaled up by the same amount. So if I double all the CIs, I get the big basket is twice as big. That's pretty, pretty standard. And as epsilon gets closer and closer to 1, 
the, co the budget share becomes very, very close to a constant. And if epsilon goes to infinity, then basically you, you can shift very quickly between goods. But that's true for all goods, because look at the, how the C enters the utility function. It's symmetric. So it's basically a statement about how substitutable goods are. It's the, a measure of the elasticity of substitution. And it's going to infinity in the one case, and in the other, it's, it's very close to implying a constant budget share, which would be like a Cobb-Douglas type of, of function, constant budget share. OK, so the consumer, what does the consumer do? Consumer is maximizing utility. It's going to do it in two steps. The first step is going to say, OK, given the prices of each of these goods, J, what am I, how much am I going to spend on each one? And then given that, how much can I save and, not, and consume today versus tomorrow? So where does the income come from? Well, the, the consumer has to earn the income. So given income Z today, it's a very simple problem. Given Z that the consumer wants to spend today, it's going to be sort of how much, can I, how much utility can I get out of this Armington aggregator given that I can only spend Z? My budget constraint is simply add up the nominal price times the qu quantity of all the goods I'm, I'm going to buy and make sure that it doesn't exceed Z. I wouldn't want to waste any, any income, so I'm going to spend it all. So we can assume that this constraint holds with equality, right? So this is like basic micro one at the master's level. So we can set up a Lagrangian. The Lagrangian looks like this. This is my utility, and this is the constraint that I have to obey that I just showed you. I can't spend more money than I have. And I can spend it on all these different goods, and there are a lot of them. But that integral shouldn't shock you. It's just the same thing as a sum, but I've got so many goods that I'm, they're not even countable. Okay. <laughs> you have to do the integration. But you can just put a sum there if you want. And a lot of, a lot of um, papers that are taught uh, prefer to have a finite number of goods. It doesn't matter. Okay. So this is, I, I cannot spend more than I have in income, but I want to make this thing as big as possible. So the first order condition will hold for each good. If I spend a little bit more on good I, then I have to spend a little bit less on all the other goods. That's clear. That's what the budget constraint is supposed to capture. And the first order condition would simply be that the marginal gain of a bit more of consumption of the, of the ith good, which is this one, has to be the impact that that spending will have on my um, marginal utility of, of wealth impacted by the fact that I have to pay PI to get another piece of that good. OK, so it's again marginal utility equals marginal, marginal uh, cost. Lambda is the currency. It's the marginal utility of, of money wealth or income in this model. So if that holds for every I, it has to hold for every good that I'm spending my money on, and there are a lot of them, but we know that it has to hold because otherwise I wouldn't be maximizing utility. And I can just, using the definition of CT, I can get rid of this nasty looking uh, thing and just, just this integral on the left hand side and just put in CT. It's the basket. So basically, it says, relative to the basket, how much of, of good I do I consume? Well, it's going to depend on the price times the marginal utility of, of income at the optimum. And of course, now you see why this epsilon is so important. It's going to give me the sensitivity of my demand curve to a change in the relative price of good I. So the reason you jump through these hoops is to get a demand curve. This is the beginning of a demand curve. The only problem is I still have this lambda, this awful Lagrange multiplier, but I'm going to get rid of it. I'm going to substitute it out. And then you will have a demand curve like we wanted to have in the first place. So if you just massage that, you have the demand for C consumption of good I on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, you have these three components. You have the Marg the marginal utility of, of income, you have the price of the ith good, and you have 
the consumption basket, the aggregate that you have. So I can manipulate this. I'm just going to show you how you do this because it's, it's something that, that I learned my sophomore year in college, but using not this notation, using just you know, two or three goods. You can do it like you do in an undergraduate course. The principle is the same. How do I get rid of the Lagrange multiplier? If I do that, then I have a demand curve that makes sense, and I can make, you can't observe a Lagrange multiplier. If you go out to the data, but you can observe quantities and prices and income. OK, so pre-multiply by the price. And you end up getting the left-hand side is what? What is the left-hand side, the interpretation? I've got the price of PI times the quantity of good I. It's not income. It's the, fra it's, the, it's the amount of money I spend on good I. It's the amount of money I spend. So if I add that up over all the I, then I will have income. So you're pretty close. The, the left-hand side is, the, f is the, the amount of money I spend on good I. And that's true for all I. So if I'm obeying my budget constraint, the left-hand side has to sum up to Z. It has to be the same thing. Otherwise, I'm cheating. OK, so I took the first order condition. I pre-multiply by this price. And then I'm going to sum it up. I'm going to integrate over all the goods. So the left-hand side is exactly Z, right? Then I can solve for lambda. And if I solve for lambda, I can get rid of lambda. I can take lambda and go back to the beginning and insert it where, where it shows up. That's the way you get rid of lambda. That's how you solve for a demand system in microeconomics. OK, so this is what Galli does. And he does something very similar. Actually, I do it different from Galli. I get the same answer. If you're interested, you can, you can look in the readings. But I've got, a, I've got an expression for lambda. It's got income in there. It's got the, the basket, the, the aggregate Armington basket. It's also got the amount of, of um, it's got a function of the prices in there. That's going to give us a, a clue as to the price level in this economy. So if I just take this lambda that I've derived, remember, lambda is true for all goods. It's, it's, a, it's a single number. And I've got I. I've got all these different goods. I can plug it into any good I or any good J. And I'm going to call this J just so you can distinguish. And you've got to, for any good J, this also has to be true. I've plugged in. You don't see any lambda anymore. The lambda's gone. That's the demand for good J, given Z, given C, chosen optimally, and given the prices that I have to take as a consumer. Because the consumer doesn't set prices. The consumer takes them. OK? I can simplify this. Look, I've just simplified it. And look what happened. I've simplified it using the definition of, of, um, of C. And I end up getting something that's a function only of the prices, something that's a function of the price of good J, and income. It sounds like a demand curve. It looks like a demand curve. It, it really does, because it's got this extra bit. It's got this price index in it. The first part is like a, an index of the price of all the prices in euros in this economy. So if I, and this is actually a, a definition. I'm going to define the CES price index in this economy as being the integration or the integral of, of a function of all the individual prices uh, weighted uh, exponentially uh, using this epsilon. That turns out to be the definition of a CES price index anyway, but I'm going to just call it that. So now I've got a PT there. So I can eliminate, I can eliminate, and you notice that this is a homogeneous index of degree one. So if I double all the prices, I double the price index. It's a very important feature of a price index, right? If I double all the prices, if I half all the prices, the, the price index should go down by 50%. OK, so now I can, I can go back and plug it in, and I've, it's, like a, it's like a miracle. I've got this demand curve, which is a function of this price index, this aggregate price index, the individual price, and income. And it's positive function of income. It's 
homothetic of degree one. So if I increase income by 1%, holding prices constant, I increase the consumption of the jth good by 1%. In fact, I'll increase them all by 1%. So this is a beautiful homothetic demand system I've derived. And it's true for any J going from address zero to, to address one. So there it is. That is my demand function. It's a function of aggregate demand, Z, which I will we'll figure out later. And then I've got this price index, so the price of all goods in the economy, if they go up, that's going to have a, an effect, only if it has a relative effect on the PJ price. So if the price of PJ, PTJ, goes up by 1%, the price of, of all other goods goes up by 1%, nothing happens. The relative price of, of those goods have not changed. This is kind of what we want in a demand system. I care about the beer price relative to everything else I have to consume. Yeah? In the first one, what condition do we uh, derive from this space? Is this the I and are we just talking about PTJ? Is this the, is there the same in the, in the, the way? So it could also be CP of, I don't know, some, some other. Yeah, it's any, any arbitrary J or I. The reason I put a J in there is because I, when I did that, I, 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 I took the sum or the integral, and that gave me a number. I didn't want you to get confused with the I because we're, we're really interested in the Ith demand. But to get the Lagrange fault, uh, multiplier, you have to integrate over all, the, all of them. So if you use I, it kind of gets confusing. So I tried, I used J just to choose another index. But it's true for any I, J, K. Yes. And that's, and that's why it's such a great, the CES aggregator is symmetric, but it's just for simplicity. You could always put weights in to say, okay, this is, this is uh, my beer weight is really high because I, <laughs> I drink a lot of beer, or maybe zero because I drink, you can do all that, but it just makes it harder and you don't have the symmetry because this is all based on the symmetry. It's gonna show up as you can see, each, pri each individual firm is looking at a, at a demand curve like this and saying, well, I know if I raise my price by 1%, I'm going to lose um, epsilon percent demand, real demand, holding everything else constant. Because a monopolistic comp competitor cannot set the wages of a, of, or the income of its, of its consumers. It has to take that as given, but it, that's what it faces. That's the downward sloping demand curve that I had in, in a picture before. Okay, so I even say that. This is the demand curve faced by the price setter. So that's, the, that's, where, the, that's where we're going. We've got a micro foundation for the monopolistic competitor, competitive firm that was, had the red triangle. So you know, if, you, if you take that, you can actually calculate the size of the red triangle if you want for a given demand shift. Right, so if Z goes from Z to Z prime, that means there's a triangle that comes up. If the marginal cost curve hasn't shifted, then gee, I can actually calculate it. And some people have done that. Okay, so that's really a, that's a really hard to, to, it's a hard sell for me. It's one of the hardest courses, the hardest lectures I have to give is teaching this. And I think Professor Weinke, because it's part of his research agenda, does a better job, okay? <laughs> but you know, there are many different ways to teach this. Same idea. All right, so you could also, there's a shortcut, which I, uh, this is what Gali does. So you can just take goods I and J and build that ratio, and then the Lagrange multiplier disappears. Because it appeared both times and just cancels out. So the ratio of the demand for good I versus good J is a function only of the relative price of those two goods. But that still doesn't kill the budget constraint problem. You still have to get, get rid of the lambda because the lambda is still there. You don't know what it is yet. Um, so you have to do a little bit of trickery, and that's what he does. Um, he takes the, the last expression, plugs into the budget constraint, solves for, for z, and he gets the same answer that I did. OK? Define the CES price index, <clears throat> and you get the same demand function. Okay, so there are two different ways to do this. The way I did it, in the first step was the way I learned it when I was in, in college, <clears throat> or in graduate school. And this is how you can do it if you if you're a big Gali fan, because it's a great book. I mean, if you're interested in New Keynesian economics. Okay, so firm set. This is the rest is easy. 
but you know you just have to write down a, a, a profit maximization problem for this firm because the firm faces this demand curve and it's also intertemporal and the firm doesn't know when it can change its price. And that's the most important thing. And that's what makes this model interesting. I'm not going to ask you to solve this, but I'm, I just want you to look at it because it gives rise to the same stuff we talked about last week. Okay, so the firm now sets its price as part of its policy. It also chooses how much to produce and how much labor to hire. And then we all of a sudden we have labor. Wow, what happened to that? Well, there's a production function. The firm has, if, if the firm uses LS labor to produce the ith good, it's going to get YS uh, multiplied by AS. So AS is like a productivity term. There's no capital in this model. This is a great weakness of the new Keynesian approach. No capital, at least in this version. Again, this is just to show you, um, everything is, we're cooking with the same water. We have a production function. It's linear now, and you've got this productivity shock. So when the productivity shock is, is large, then in positive, the firm will hire more labor. And in the general equilibrium, something's going to have to happen because the workers have to be motivated to work. But in the meantime, it's facing this demand curve. And this, each firm is it's just firm I, right? Firm I doesn't produce three or four goods. It produces one good. It's, a, it's a, literally a monopolistic competitive firm. And the first order condition is a plan, just like with Rodenberg, it's a plan, except you're basically going to know, and this is the most important thing, with some probability you will not be able to change your price. Even though you'd like to change your price, you can't. And that's why this, lamb, this gamma shows up. This gamma is a way of capturing this, this probability of, of getting stuck. Okay, so it'd be like phi, um, one, one minus phi in the, other, um, in the other setup. Okay, so we have, and I'll just leave it at that because if, if there's, a, there's a lot of math uh, that I'm not gonna show you. The first order conditions would involve exactly setting marginal benefit to marginal cost, marginal revenue to marginal cost, um, given that I can change. Okay, so you end up getting the same uh, setup as we had before, and you can, you can show that you'll have a, um, this Calvo stickiness showing up in the Phillips, in the Phillips curve or the aggregate uh, demand curve. So, supply curve. So we've only talked about supply. We've only talked about this one curve, you know, why is it positively sloped? We've got a pretty good story now. This is where people get excited about macros. How do you close the model? How do we get the demand side? And that's, that's what I'm going to spend the rest of this hour talking about. Because once we do that, then we have both, and we have a good story for this, and we have a good story for this, and then we can tell our friends about how smart we are, how much we know about macro. Yeah, so, so that zero to one is like the, the name of the good. I mean, it's, it's just a, a quantitative way of thinking of a list of goods in the economy which is fixed, okay? So there's, there's no innovation in this economy. There's no like new iPhone uh, 15 or something. There's just, there's just an iPhone or a mobile phone. And each, the number on that interval zero to one is like the address that corresponds to, to good Whatever. It's a list. What? It could be yeah, it, it, could be, it could be infinite, but then it would be kind of hard to, to make that. <laughs> the idea is to have a, a finite um, bound on the, it's a good question. I mean, you could probably do the whole thing with an infinite list, but it, it, it doesn't correspond very well with our um, view of, of reality, okay? You can change this model to have an expanding list of, of products. So expanding variety is, is certainly an aspect that we observe in, in economic growth. Um, you can also just kick out the integral and do everything with, count, with a countable number of goods. Okay, you can just have 50 goods. But, you know, you lose something. <laughs> it's a good question why, we, but it's just, I'm just kind of giving you what the the macro world has, has been dealing with for the past few decades. Okay, so how do I close this model? This is where it gets exciting, because now you can finally start reading the newspaper and understanding what's going on. We have to close this model. We need a model of demand for goods and services, because I've just shown you how the, the firms supply the goods and services. How do, the, how do we get demand? 
Well, fortunately, we already thought about this a lot. We've been thinking about this throughout the whole course. It's about intertemporal choice. Do I consume now or do I consume later? Everything in economics and macro is about intertemporal choice. Do I invest now or do I put it off till next year? Do I eat now or do I eat later? And if I eat a lot now, then demand is high, and maybe in the future demand is going to go down. Right now, we're all faced with this big oil price shock, and we're all saying, oh, we really feel poor now. I'm not going to spend any money. I'm going to wait till next year. I'm not going to go on vacation this year. OK, so that's kind of what we want. We need a, a story that is, is somehow consistent with the other story I gave you, because I talked about already these, these, these little products that add up in, a, in an Armington way. I still need to ask, how does the consumer intertemporal substitute? Well, I wrote down the problem before. We know what that does. That has a, gives rise to a, an Euler equation. Now we have this intertemporal optimal behavior, which means that the rate of growth of my consumption is going to be somehow related to the, to the, the rewards from deferring consumption. So if interest rate is high in, in real terms, I'm, my consumption is going to grow faster over time. I'm going to consume less today relative to tomorrow. We call that saving. You learned that at the very beginning of the course. Remember Ramsey? It's all about Ramsey. <laughs> right? The Ramsey rule. Um, and that's what aggregate demand is going to be in this model. But we have, we have the central bank. And in the RBC model, we didn't have a central bank. There was no money. Now we have to worry about the central bank. The central bank sets the interest rate. The interest rate sets our intertemporal incentive to save and, and to consume. And it's the real interest rate, and the central bank cannot set the real interest rate. It can only set the nominal interest rate. OK? So the RBC model is the starting point. That's why I taught that first, is that you understand, well, I know now the consumer wants to sort of defer consumption if the, if the rate of return on savings is high, um, and if it's only especially if it's only temporary, uh, it gives me some incentive to, to shift my consumption around. So this was called the Euler equation. So I already did that. Okay, And in that model that I just showed you before, the Euler equation looks like this, because we don't have capital. We just have this bond that you can buy. This bond that's out there, you can call it a bank loan, or you can call it a government bond if it's, if it's an outside type of, of asset. And basically it says that the the marginal rate of substitution <clears throat> between consumption today and tomorrow is linked to the real interest rate that I'm facing. And you can see that if you look carefully at this, the left-hand side is the, is the marginal rate of substitution of one euro today for one euro tomorrow. If I give up one euro today, what do I get tomorrow? I get one plus i. i is the, is the nominal interest rate. If I give up one divided by one plus i, then I get one euro tomorrow. Right? That's the intertemporal price. On the right-hand side, I have the marginal rate of substitution of consumption today paying PT for that consumption, and that's that Armington aggregator, for PT plus one consumption I have to pay tomorrow. So that's kind of like the inflation rate. PT plus one divided by PT is the inflation rate, plus one. So if I put my money in, 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 this, in this, if I invest my money in this bond and I get some nominal money back, I really do care about the price level. If the price level jumps next period, it's not worth that much. It's kind of a loss for me. Okay, so that's, that's kind of, it's, it's what the consumer is expecting because the consumer doesn't know what the inflation rate's gonna be over the next period. We certainly didn't know that well, gas prices would rise by 500% in six months. That was kind of a surprise. People had an expectation that something was cooking, but they didn't think it was going to be like that. Okay. This is an economy where that is a key driver of demand. And that's going to be the basis of our aggregate demand curve. Okay. I just saw someone look at his watch. Maybe I should check my watch too. <laughs> <laughs> Got 10 minutes left. All right, so the, if you take this thing and log linearize it like we talked about before, you end up getting this beautiful last line on the slide. The last mathematical line says that, that as a deviation from the trend, aggregate demand is a function of the expectation of next period's output or demand 
minus an effect that depends on the interest rate. So this is kind of a, this is the intertemporal substitution uh, coming in. Now the model we had is a very simple model, so this is a very simple function, and the more, the more fancy function would have a, a, all sorts of other things going on. We'll talk about it in the last lecture. But you can see it has a negative effect of the nominal interest rate, holding the inflation expectations constant. And this last term, this beta inverse minus one, is the subjective discount rate. It's how impatient I am. Okay? So now the whole thing, where does, where does money, where does this monetary, this, this IT come from? Well, it comes from monetary policy. The ECB, the Fed, the Bank of England set the nominal interest rate. Because we think that money is neutral, we're going to basically take the, the central bank uh, seriously because we, 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 we think that money is neutral in the long run, but in the short run it's not neutral, and therefore we care about the central bank and we want to do it right. It's a fact that the central bank doesn't just give around 50 euro bills to go around giving 50 euros to everybody. That's not how they do monetary policy. They could. <laughs> they could just throw money out the window, helicopter money, but they don't do that. Right? And there's probably a good reason for that. It might be very violent. I mean, imagine if they, they just, <laughs> and people would be cheating and all that kind of stuff. So we don't do it like that. The way the central bank controls monetary conditions is it controls the nominal interest rate. And the nominal interest rate is the rate at which banks can refinance their lending to you and me. And indirectly how people can finance their investments in other assets using um, financial institutions. So fact, central bank sets this nominal interest rate, they set a policy rate, and the financial system takes the policy rate and marks up on it, uh, the banks mark up on it, you have a mortgage rate, all these other things follow from this nominal interest rate policy. So we're really gonna care about the interest rate, and even though we haven't talked about it in this course very much, we know this is the case. The central bank can do a lot with their balance sheet to make sure that if they want interest rates to be 2%, they will be 2%, because they are the ultimate money maker. They are the market maker in nominal assets that bear the riskless rate of interest. Right? That's the way they work. And we, we, we spent a half a lecture talking about that in the, in the middle of the course, talking about where money comes from. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna belate that. But the cool thing is because prices are sticky, the central bank can do this. If prices were perfectly flexible, any model you can think of, the central bank would be kind of irrelevant. And in a hyperinflation, it is irrelevant. If the price of money is, is uh, if the price of goods in terms of money is rising by 100% per month, okay, the central bank can't set interest rates. It's lucky if it can print enough banknotes to get into circulation. It's, a, it's actually a very big logistic problem in a hyperinflation. Okay, so in a, in a normal world that we live in, the banks um, refinance their loans at the central bank, and that's the interest rate that's relevant. Okay, so basically we can see where everything else follows because the real interest rate is just an adjustment uh, using the Fisher equation. Inflation plus the real interest rate is somehow the nominal interest rate by definition, the real interest rate is the nominal interest rate minus the expectation of inflation. That you have to know. That's master's material, <laughs> right? The Fisher, or some call it the Wicksell equation, because Wicksell was a, probably did it first. The Americans are better at marketing. Fisher was an American, Wicksell was Swedish, okay? Why does the central bank set interest rates? That's the big question. We already talked about it indirectly. Taylor, we talked about the toy model, the Taylor rule says the central bank is trying to keep inflation rate near its target, because it's already made public its target, and then it tries to keep output close to the trend. Right? That was the, the so-called Taylor rule. And that's how, that's how I close the model. I take the Euler equation, add the Taylor rule, and I'm done. Amazing, right? The central bank chooses a policy rate, therefore the central bank chooses the rate of inflation. This money, the money supply doesn't show up in this model because the central bank is supplying whatever money it takes to meet its Taylor rule and to meet its target inflation rate. So in some sense, it's, 
The central bank says, I want, I'm, I'm going to accept 20% inflation, sorry. And then they just do whatever it takes to keep the economy close to 20% inflation. That's the Taylor rule. And if inflation gets higher, they raise interest rates. If they, inflation gets lower, they cut interest rates. And if the economy starts booming and exploding, they raise interest rates. If the economy's in a depression, they cut interest rates. That's the Taylor rule. So we've closed the circle now. We just take the Taylor rule, insert it into the Euler equation, and I have an aggregate demand equation. I'm done. I'm done with that. <laughs> but the target inflation is the key thing now, right? So what is the target inflation of, of the European Central Bank? What do they say right now? They've been saying for a long time, 2%. Two. Somehow, I don't think they're really so serious about it every quarter. Maybe they are in the long run. Maybe, but they're kind of letting thing ha things happen. What does the Turkish central bank say? Do they have a policy rate? They're certainly not publishing it, but they are accepting 80% inflation right now. So to me, the evidence is the Turkish central bank, no, no matter what they say, I mean, I hope they're not saying 5% or 10%, because <laughs> that's not credible at all. And central banks want to be credible. They always want to say something that actually happens, otherwise they look stupid. Right? So think about that. You know, the, the market judges you on what you do, not what you say. OK, so I'm almost done. We have a Taylor rule. Taylor was this in incredibly uh, brilliant economist who basically said, look, you know, I've, I've looked at a lot of central banks. We can say whatever we want, but in general, when inflation gets higher and they've relative to their target, they, they raise interest rates, and they may have a higher target rate, but given the target rate, they tend to react with an increased, increased interest rate. Similarly, when economies are in bad shape, they tend to cut interest rates. So that's just kind of the way they, they operate. And that's what he wrote down. He wrote this down. It's just a simple target nominal rate. The target nominal rate is, of course, the real interest rate plus the inflation rate target inflation rate, and then you've got the deviation from the target, and you've got the output gap. Okay? It's not an ironclad rule. It's not in the Constitution, but believe me, if a central bank keeps saying 2% inflation, 2% inflation, they better keep to it, otherwise people will get upset and kick them out. And literally, it means that the money supply the central bank puts into the market is elastic around that interest rate. So the supply of money is literally el infinitely elastic. Until they change that target interest rate, they're just going to supply whatever the market wants or take back whatever the market wants because you can, the banks can give money back to the central bank. They can repay their loans. Right? The balance, balance sheet can contract. It doesn't have to just expand. You've, you've grown up in a period when it's been expanding, but I've seen periods when it's been shrinking. Right? If you have a financial crisis, for example. So this is the famous picture. Taylor, you know, just... <laughs> put in some numbers and look what happens. It, it tracks pretty well. No econometrics. You can do econometrics, but it looks pretty good. Okay? So we're, we're done. Basically, you take the Taylor rule, plug it into the Euler equation, log linearized, and you get this thing that looks like a downward sloping function relating demand output on the left hand side to a function of inflation, negative on the right-hand side. And you've got future inflation and all the rest. We'll talk about that next time. This is a forward-looking and very, very convincing aggregate demand curve because it depends on people's mood. If people get really scared about future output, you know, if you see the, the, the first term, if people think there's going to be a crash, then they'll stop spending today. There's going to be some, some drag on the economy. If people get optimistic, they get lots of, you know, checks from the, the government, <laughs> then demand will be higher uh, today, even though it's going to actually be higher tomorrow. OK. I'm done. Thanks for your attention, and thanks for bearing with me this Armington aggregator. Uh, for those of you who are interested, it will be interesting for you in the future. Have a great week. See you next time.